Okay, thanks very much, uh, Cheryl. And I do know when you were saying there's an 18 minute limit that you're talking specifically to me. So um, I'm going to make sure that uh, I don't let you down here. Um, when you talk about uh, innovation with respect to the construction industry, I mean, most people think about you know, roads and bridges. Uh, I mean, they've been building in the same way for uh, tens, hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, but, but really, our industry these days is, is more and more about innovation um, in everything we do every day with respect to how do we, um, how do we procure the work, uh, how do we estimate the work, how do we approach our business plans, and then how do we actually go and, and execute it. Um, we, we've often said, it, it, of all the industries, this is the one that you, you have to innovate or you die. And it, it, really, is, uh, it really is a case in point. Um, about uh, 25 years ago, the, the, the buzzword in this industry was design build. And uh, uh, the Kewitt companies at, at that time um, had probably in the order of uh, about 20, 15 to 20 percent of their revenue, mostly in the industrial side of things where that's very commonplace, uh, done through that model. Um, today, our company with uh, gross revenues in the order of about 12 billion dollars throughout North America, we do fully 80 to 80, 80 to 85 percent of our uh, work is done uh, through a design build format. So I'm going to try and focus on just some of the innovations that we have found uh, in the industry. Um, I could go on about one project down in ad nauseum, as Cheryl can attest, but I'm going to just try and pick a couple of good ones and walk you through some of the ideas that we came up with. The first one I'm going to talk about uh, is actually, it's, it's uh, almost a, a career ago it was the Confederation Bridge, which was built out in Eastern Canada. And the challenge in this one was the design and construction of a, of a fixed link uh, over a, a major ice covered strain, strait. And there were, there were a lot of uh, constraints that were put uh, in place with the contractor. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Canadian geography, uh, the province of Prince Edward Island is the smallest province, but actually the most uh, dense with respect to population per a square kilometer in uh, in all of Canada. Just an interesting little tidbit there. So shortest point uh, between Cape German and Borden um, is seen right here, uh, which linked up uh, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. Originally, they had ice boats to get across back uh, when uh, PEI joined Confederation uh, back in uh, 1873. Uh, then things got um, uh, much more um, innovative and they used to have ferries which in uh, many many cases uh, were often stuck in the ice for hours if not days at a time. Um, most people in Atlantic Canada actually didn't complain about this because the rule on the ferry was if the ferry gets stuck in the ice it's free coffee and donuts till we get back to the port. So that was uh, looked at as being actually a benefit. So just to give you a little background on what was required on this job uh, in 1993, there was, a, there was originally a call for an expression A7. Um, at this time, P3 um, design, build, operate, maintain was very, very new in the industry and it took some time for the, for the whole process to get going. But in 1993, there was an award made for this job. And at that time, uh, they put in place some fairly uh, onerous constraints. It had to have a 100 year design life, a higher factor of safety, uh, had to obviously be designed for all known loading conditions uh, and it had to be in service by June 1st of 97 which was uh, exactly three and a half years after uh, the project was awarded. So you can see the total uh, distance here at about 12.9 kilometers so the, the real challenge that the design builder had was in three and a half years we had to get something designed and constructed uh, and uh, open for traffic uh, we had to come up with means and methods that had total certainty that allow us to do that. So the best way to come up with that was to, to break it down and, and we call it eating the elephant one bite at a time, break it into small pieces. And, um, the, the actual main bridge of this uh, project was 176 pieces, uh, but they were actually pretty big bites. The uh, uh, biggest piece was about 8,000 tons. But these were pieces that could be built off-site, transported to site, and then erected in place. And 
that allowed the work to proceed uh, year round um, under fairly onerous constraints. You can see here, these are all the individual pieces. You've got a pier base that sits on the bottom. You've got an ice shield, pier shaft, and a main girder. And then they're tied together with these drop-ins. So they're actually just four unique pieces that were done over and over and over again. And on long jobs, repetition is key to being able to get things done efficiently, cost-effectively, and on time. Um, biggest challenge we then had was we had to come up with a place to build it. Now we had to find it, uh, mobilize it within a year. Uh, we had to be able to work there 11 and a half months of the year. Uh, we had to be able to fabricate every one of the components. As you can see, they're uh, fairly diverse in their size and shape. And it had to be large enough uh, to store all the components uh, that were getting ready to be, uh, to be erected. So in this case, we, uh, we were able to procure a 150-acre farmer's field. Uh, he was a potato grower. He's now retired and lives in Florida. Um, and we were able to use this for uh, fabricating all the pieces. Now, one of the main challenges we had here uh, was dealing with the ice conditions out on the strait. Uh, so the ice shield pier shaft component uh, had to be able to withstand fairly severe ice loadings uh, because the strait freezes solid every year. Um, so a little bit of a graphic here, you can see what we designed is a cone at the water level and after spending what was a lot of money at that time, about a million dollars on ice testing and research, we confirmed the size and the slope of that cone, the surface of it and whatnot, uh, to be able to come up with a designable ice load uh, for the project. And this fails the ice sheet in flexure as opposed to compression. Um, and at that time, I mean, we're talking about uh, 20 years ago now, this was state of the art when it came to um, the design relative to uh, ice loading. We started out because we didn't know what to build it out of. We started out with a steel skin on it and we started working away on the steel skin and we realized, you know, this is going to have maintenance issues. Uh, it actually isn't in our budget and we better come up with a better plan. And so about a third of the way through the job, we decided to change, um, change uh, gears and we came up with a concrete ice shield. Um, and that in itself was a fairly major challenge because it had to be able to be uh, done while we were already building. Um, it had to be um, constructible um, and last for 100 years as well. We came up with about a 90 to 100 MPA concrete mix design, which at that time, the only other place you'd find something like that was in laboratories. And we were uh, casting several thousand cubic meters a day uh, to build these ice shield components. But the biggest piece of all was the main girder at 8,000 tons, is 192 meters long. And so the constraints around being able to actually put that, um, build it, uh, design it, build it, and put it in place were, uh, at that time, was, uh, was state of the art. Um, we had to come up with a vessel that was going to be able to put, the, uh, put all the pieces in place, but the main girder was the biggest constraint. We had to find, we had to be able to mobilize this vessel within one year. It had to be self-propelled and able to erect one piece per day, 176 pieces, 176 days. That was our erection schedule. It had to be able to erect the largest component, uh, and plus all the other different types, and it had to be able to work in the sea conditions out in Northumberland Strait. We were fortunate enough to be able to, uh, they were just finishing the store belt project over in Denmark. We were able to get the vessel from them, uh, retrofit it, and put it in place uh, in order to uh, uh, meet our schedule, and here you can see it's setting a girder. Um, the, the, ultimately, the Confederation Bridge was a successful job. It was uh, open, designed, and constructed, and open uh, on time back in, uh, in June of 1997, and is today out there successfully undergoing some of the most severe ice loads that, uh, that we have, certainly, in uh, this hemisphere. Next project I want to talk about uh, was a, uh, the, the constraint that we were dealing with here was, again, it was a fast track. It was, in this case, it was extremely fast track. We called it, actually, it was stupid. It was so fast track uh, to build an elevated guideway through an urban environment um, in the time that we had. Uh, in 1999, the BC government awarded a contract for a 16 kilometer extension of the SkyTrain project. It had to be built to SkyTrain tolerances, which are some of the most exacting in the business, and we had to do it all in less than 24 months. 
Now the original uh, Expo Line uh, SkyTrain uh, had a solution that included dual uh, girders, uh, 30 meter spans. Uh, it had uh, they were continuous two span frames. Uh, there was uh, and and you can see the configuration accordingly up here. So uh, we looked at that and said, how can we make this uh, make this faster, uh, better, and more efficient? And we came up with the concept of a single uh, dual track box girder. It allowed us to lengthen the spans to 37 meters, and we did it with a precast segmental concept. Instead of one full length 100 foot girder, we had several uh, 10 foot long uh, components of that girder. Uh, they were simply supported spans, all of them, so there was no, no, no continuity, and we were able to put them on single large diameter caissons. So this was a repetition of a theme that allowed us to stretch this out over the 10 kilom or sorry, the 10 miles or 16 kilometers that uh, we, uh, we had contracted to do. So now we had to build a factory to do it. So we set up, at that time it was in Port Moody. Today, there are condos sitting on this. We should have actually held on to it afterwards. We'd probably make more money, but uh, we set up 35 beds to cast a close to 6,000 segments over about a 12 month period. Uh, in order to, uh, to facilitate the supply. It's done in a, what's called a short line match cast method where we build each one of these, they're basically slices of the, uh, of the, final, uh, of the final girder. Uh, we're then able to, um, we're able to handle them, stack them, transport them, and erect them very, very efficiently. So you say, well, how do you put them up in the air? And uh, what we used is, uh, and, and you may have seen these subsequently, uh, working on uh, the subsequent lines on the Canada line and now on the Evergreen line. These are overhead erection trusses. So we set up four of these trusses working seven days a week, 24 hours a day in order to meet the erection schedule. This is a span by span erection truss. Here we can see a schematic basically just how it uh, moves along and it would erect one span per day. Okay, so every seven days there would be seven spans out behind this. We had a total of about 500 spans. So those of you who are good with math can figure out how long it took us to put the guideway up with four trusses. The other trusses we had were called combo trusses because there were some long spans in there that had to go over uh, some of the uh, railways, uh, Highway 1, uh, some river crossings and whatnot. So this one could actually work on both types of structures. You can see uh, what a uh, large span structure looks like there. Flip the head there real quick, and this is the truss in action. In the end, uh, we put up 5,700 segments, uh, comprising about 500 spans in uh, 11 months with four trusses. And, and it was, uh, this same system has been used on the subsequent, uh, it's been so efficient, it's been used on the subsequent SkyTrain projects. So the last one, and it looks like I'm on schedule here, Cheryl, so you might lose your bet. Uh, last one I just wanted to touch on is some of the innovation that we were able to put in place on the recent Portman Highway 1 project, um, specifically the main crossing, uh, the new Portman Bridge. In this case, we had a very, very uh, uh, environmentally sensitive waterway, the Fraser River, uh, um, that we had to uh, build over, uh, operating railway with 13 tracks underneath, and there were some other major constraints as well. Total project at a value of about 2.4 billion, uh, included 17 interchanges and 37 kilometers of road upgrades. Me being partial to bridges, I call it a bridge with some approach roads uh, to the chagrin of my colleagues. The new 10 lane bridge over the Fraser River uh, demolished the existing bridge um, and have it all completed in less than four years. So that was the task that, uh, that we signed up for. So our scheme um, was to build a 470 meter long cable stay uh, bridge across the Fraser River. You can see here the major constraints we had. This is the navigation channel, so nothing permanently could be in here and we could only work in there under very temporary conditions. There is also a working passage on this side and another one off the picture. And then there are a total of 13 um, serviceable railway lines that working, worked under this portion of it. So we had to be able to put a plan in place that would get this bridge up and, uh, and operating uh, in time without uh, um, going into any of those, uh, those areas um, and, and impacting the environment or the operation of the railway. So the configuration of the whole project consisted of um, the approach spans, 
um, on, the, on the north side and the south side here, leading up and tying into the highway. Here we can see the marine foundations. This were the land foundations that had to get built. Uh, this was the land uh, superstructure for the approach spans. Um, and then we have the main span itself here. In order to get this, um, in order to get this main span pylon in place in time uh, to meet our schedule, we actually uh, brought up one of the largest derrick barges in North America, an 800 ton uh, ringer out of our uh, Marine Department down in Federal Way uh, to loft and drive these piles, uh, 240, uh, 270 foot single pick, uh, drive them down into the, uh, into the till down below. Um, then in order to get uh, the pile cap put in place, we came up with a plan for uh, actually precasting that component um, in a single 2200 ton bathtub that was built in a dry dock and then it was floated over and put into place subsequent to that. Um, and we found this to be not necessarily the most cost effective, but it was far more schedule effective when it came to building the critical marine pylon. And on a, on a cable stay bridge, I probably should have mentioned, it doesn't matter how fast you build the approaches or any other bit of it, unless you get the pylons done and up and the stays going, you're behind on the critical path. So you have to fail focus on the critical path. And in this case, we had one pylon on land, one out in the river. So the one that was in the river, we had to get permits, we had to get access, you saw the marine constraints. So this was the one that we had to focus on in terms of coming up with means and methods that allow us to get it done on time. So the main span erection techniques that we came up with to deal with the constraints we had uh, included on the marine side, we put in place some, uh, they were called uh, specially designed lifters that could actually lift the components up off of the water um, without having to have access from the land. And then on the land side where we had to build over the railway tracks, uh, we have what are called derrick cranes, very, very similar to the ones that actually built the original bridge um, and then a conventional crane on the back that could then service and bring out material out onto the front. So you can see here, this is a derrick crane working out over the railway tracks. It's, a, it's basically a, a very old uh, cable winch system uh, that's able to swing across out the individual components, put the deck panels in place, and here you can see the work in progress out over the railway tracks. These cycles were done on a two-week basis. Each side, we, every two weeks, we would progress out one length with the stays and the deck. And uh, at no time did we ever impact the, uh, the, the railway down below. We had a very, very good re working relationship with them. Here you can see the derricks in the front and the crane in the back, some of the pictures. And then on the, on the uh, marine side, we said, well, because again, this one's critical, it started later, we needed to go faster. Uh, in our business, when you need to go faster, uh, need to pick up time, you need to get some fancier toys. So we bought some fancier toys. At about two million bucks a pop, we bought these four lifters that were able to work out on the front uh, and able to pick up uh, steel segments that were already prefabricated up off the water. Uh, these were prefabricated in a yard about three kilometers downstream, put on a barge, shipped up, and then each one of the um, 100 ton pieces was then uh, lifted into place on that cycle, basically to bring a barge into place, lift up about an hour. So we were able to get about a one hour shutdown each time and get these pieces up in place. And again, the cycle time, because we have uh, these fancy toys, was about two days faster per cycle than over on the other side. And so the time difference between the start on one side and the other, we were able to um, get the closure at basically the same time. This just gives you a view from up top. This is uh, fully mobilized with the lifters out there. And here you can see both sides basically got out the closure at the same time. Um, and as you probably know, we opened on schedule December 1st, 2012, uh, as our contract required. I could go on and on, but I'm out of time. So thank you very much. Okay.